Hey, welcome to town. Thank nice you so to have much. you here. Thrilled to be here. I want to start right in about this book um, by having you read us this letter that your brother wrote to you when he was at the University of Pennsylvania and you were the younger sister. It starts right down there. Remind us roughly what the year was. Well, the year was 1965, and I think the moral of the story is never have a younger sister who never throws away a piece of paper. It's always good not to have family members who are journalists. Oh boy, I discovered this, I discovered this letter only about four or five months before I finished the book, Cynthia, and I thought, oh my God, there it all is. It was always there. You know, a paper trail always sets it straight. Read us the letter. Dear Marie, only people from Brooklyn use the word geez. I am sure mother coerced you into writing that mass of nonsense. Your letter does not have a single worthwhile sentence in it. I will not buy you any notebooks. I repeat, no notebooks, but I will send you some decals that are not to be placed in my room, around my room, or on the window of my car. Okay, who was this guy, and why did you set out to tell this story? This guy was my fantastic, maddening, bossy, difficult, ultimately wonderful older brother, Carl. He was the red state to my blue state. All you have to understand to know about how complicated and difficult this relationship was was my first memory of my brother was when he sailed me out a window when I was about two years old and I wound up in the emergency room in the San Antonio hospital with a, just a cut on my eyebrow and the family joke about it became that he gave me the gift of a hard head. He went from there to being the youngest member of the John Birch Society, tracking alleged communists by the time he was 12 and um, coming into my room to smash my Joan Baez records because there she was right there on his subversive list. So he was complicated, but saying all that, he was mysterious. He grew up to be a trial lawyer turned apple orchardist and you know, part of the kind of maddening sibling thing was understanding the control freak nature that my brother had. For example, every year he would send me a box of fruit, but the fruit, which was, you know, he grew in his gorgeous orchards in Washington State, the fruit came with what we called the, the tax, the Carl tax, where you would get like 25 telephone calls before the fruit came, such as, the fruit is coming next week, are you gonna be home? This is all said in a Texas accent. And I'd say, well, I don't know. And he'd say, well, you have to be there. And I said, why? And he said, because they're my pears, and they're precious, and you have to put them in the refrigerator the minute they come in. So I learned to say, okay, then the fruit would come, and it would be wrapped like it was, you know, a bomb or something. Each fruit, each pear, these go gorgeous Asian pears, would have like styrofoam socks around them and tape over that. And it would be like a kind of a, a, a bomb that would come into the house. So then after the fruit came, you'd get a series of phone calls. You know, did the fruit get there on time? Can I demand a, a refund from the UPS man? Are you sure? Did you write down exactly what time it came? So that was my brother. So you've been carrying this story around, obviously, all your life. Absolutely. And what happened? Why decide to turn it into a book-length narrative? Well, it was, a, it was a huge decision, and it came completely, you know, I think so many of us carry around this sibling thing, you know, in the attic of our mind, and mine was very much in the attic. Um, it came for me because something happened in our life which really transformed our relationship, and it was huge for me, and I think it was huge for him. We really learned how to become a team, and 
we had a, my brother had a crisis and wrote me a letter about it, uh, kind of a stunning letter that came like a time bomb in my life in which he told me when he was really quite young, barely 50, that he had um, a very rare form of lung cancer, a non-smoker's lung cancer. And it came as like, it was all typed out, again, like the fruit in a control freak way, um, a lawyer's letter that came by FedEx, completely mysterious, when he had just been together for four or five days for Thanksgiving, suddenly I'm getting this manifesto, I'm asking you to help me save my life. And when that letter came into the house, my life changed completely. And then the great task became how to come together. So, which we did, and it, it, it again, it was, it was a huge experience. I never thought I would write about it. I didn't think I could ever bring myself to. And yet you took notes all the way through. Because I, <laughs> of course, but diaries. You know, I'm a, I'm a diarist. I, I write in a journal almost every day. And I was trying to come up with a new book idea. And I've been spending a lot of time, as we spoke about, in India. And of course, I wanted to write about this. So the first day I was to meet Sarah Crichton at Farrar Strauss to talk about book ideas. We had never met. And within seconds of meeting, we discovered quite by accident that we both had an older, a brother thing, that she had a brother who was as mysterious to her as mine was to me. So it was just so perfect, Cynthia. Within seconds, we had launched on our brothers. And forget India. We stayed there for the next three hours. We closed the cafe. And at the end, Sarah stood up and she said, you know, this brother-sister thing is huge. And no one writes about it. No one talks about it, the effect our brothers and sisters have on us. This is your next book. This is what you need to write. And I said, oh, are you kidding me? I could never go there, write anything so personal. Oh, my God, never. And that's how it started. When you were working on this and you talked to people, friends, other people who would say, what are you working on? And you'd say this book about my relationship with my difficult older brother. What happened? What kind of doors opened up? What did you learn about what people carry around about their siblings? Well, it's huge. We, so many of us share this. It's like the Asian flu. And, you know, it's like such a common thing. And um, the first year of w trying to work on this, I couldn't do it. And so I approached it like a reporter. You know, I was dancing around what it was really about, which was the red hot emotions between the two of us and where it had come from. So I spent a year reporting, interviewing every sibling expert, every person out there doing, you know, I flew to London to even once interview this psychiatrist who had written an obscure monograph, The Importance of Sibling Relationships and Psychoanalysis. You know, this got me nowhere, you know. When, Did you uh, learn anything interesting in that I process? I learned so many fascinating Toss things. Toss out a couple of them. Well, for example, by the age of 11, we are spending a third of our time with our brothers and sisters, far more than we do with our parents, with our friends. And yet it has taken 80 years for psychiatry and family therapy to even say, maybe this is important. So by the time you get to be adults, often you are strangers, you're foreigners. There's the national statistic is about 45 to 50 percent of us have what they call challenged relationships. That you have, you know, sort of like borderline things. 10 percent of people don't speak to their siblings at all. 12 percent are what my brother and I were, which were what they call borderlines, meaning You'd like to make it better, you know, like your, like my brother, we were moose with our antlers locked together, but we were in contact. But, you know, it was like always there was cotton batting between us, and, you know, you would brace yourself to be with your, I would always brace myself. My brother's going to start one of his tirades about neoconservative politics. He's going to start defending, you know, all, all these kind of shadow issues. And then about half of us have pretty good relationships and think of their brothers and sisters as good friends. And as you were hearing the stories of the people that you knew well, 
was that sort of the next phase in all this? You're madly running around getting all of this academic and intellectual grounding for sibling relationships, then what happened? Well, you know, again, it's a trigger. You know, like so many people would say, what are you working on? And I would say, well, the story of my brother and me. And the first thing that people would say is, well, let me tell you about my sister. And oh my God, my brother is such a jerk. And oh my God, I haven't spoken to my sister in 15 years. But you know, even so, when you carry this around, you know, we're like minnows swimming in the well of childhood as brothers and sisters. And one of the great questions for me, and I think for many of us is, why can't we see our brother or sister as others see them. You know, there was Carl Brenner, a fantastic Apple guy, um, an expert on opera, many friends. He was this alpha, really kind of quite romantic figure. He flew a plane. He looked a bit like Harrison Ford. Um, many lady friends. Many lady running friends. And out of the divorced, narrative, right? divorced, lots of girlfriends you know, wine lover, connoisseur, why couldn't I, why did I think of him as this kind of, you know, monster man, my older brother, or not monster man, but just very difficult person, and why did he see me as, you know, this is his perception, which of course, you know, I'm perfectly willing to say, that's me, put the mirror up, oh, you know, have to miss know-it-all, expert, you know, his perception of me was, just again, that little sister that was always trying to get attention. So this is pathetic. We would get together and we would fight over everything. It was like we were back fighting in the back seat of the car. The first time I went out to the apple orchards, we had a huge blistering fight within 24 hours of being together. About what? How to pick his fruit. I wasn't doing it correctly. I was bruising the apple, he said. Oh, you're bruising my fruit. It's pathetic. We were back to being toddlers. And I think that that's what so many of us get into. You get stuck in that role playing because you're so stamped as children with, this, with the roles. The character that we see in this thing most of the time is pretty objectively difficult. Not just somebody who's always irritated at his sister, but somebody who's mean, who's made his mother sad and angry for a lot of the time and whose mm -hmm. reaction to most things is to be sour and hostile. How much of that did you end up feeling was you in the lens that you were looking at and how much of it do you think was really Carl? Well, a great deal of it. And you know, that was all very- A great deal of it was which? Was, was my lens, mm. my lens. Because again, it, the book is written as a drama between a brother and a sister. And it's mm -hmm. a double family story of how skewed and blind our perceptions often are. But it takes place in that moment of emotional, you know, it's, it's, it's really written in dramatic scenes. Right. So it takes place from the tormented younger sister's point of view. And that lens is distorted. And one of the most challenging aspects, and really excruciating, painful for me, writing Apples and Oranges, was when I had to hold the mirror up and say, what's my responsibility here, you know? And how, and I, how can I put this on the page? You know, how, what a, what just what a, how I drove my brother crazy. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Your books, you're known as an investigative reporter. You do long, complex narratives, often involving international dramas and situations. Um, I'm curious to know what was hardest about memoir for someone who's lived her life as a working, observing journalist. Oh, well, that's such a good question. Well, well, actually, let me preface it with another bit from here, which got me as somebody who has similar tendencies. Um, this is another portion. This is from 05, and I would like it if you would read from here. Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is a moment in the book where um, I'm kind of flipping out writing about my brother and I'm listening to tapes because of course I've gone back now to the orchards. My brother has died at a young age and it, I've gone back to the orchards to do 
a zillion interviews with all the Apple people, and I just keep doing this dancing around what it was really about. And I'm listening to the tapes, and I say, I'm outside the event, although I'm in the middle of it. It is protection, part of the latex that covers me. Making tapes allows me to reprocess, to craft a grid that I can understand on situations that are incomprehensible. At this moment, I suddenly want to change everything that is in me, the observer part, and move into something else, the living your life part. When does that start exactly? And something else. I look into the mirror and someone says, what are you doing here? You have no right to live. Why did you become a reporter in the first place? Oh, I think it was, it was stamped in my DNA. I mean, I was so lucky, Cynthia. Earlier we were talking about our shared Mexican, Mexican history, but in, in my house, uh, first of all, I came from a house in San Antonio, South Texas, of big opinions. My father, was a kind of district attorney without portfolio. You know, other fathers, other Jewish fathers in San Antonio played golf or they you know, taught when Well, you better do, do the short, odd bio here. This yes. is a Jewish district attorney in San Antonio who was actually born in Aguascalientes, That's Mexico. That's right, uh, originally right. from Mexico. And his whole passion in life was corruption. The family owned a discount store. And that wasn't where his heart was. He was running this family business, but his heart was exposing the bad guys. And it became, for a reporter, it became the most fantastic training ground. At the dinner table, my father would talk nonstop, holding forth, the mayor is a crook, the senator is a crook, I'm gonna get that guy, and he would. He would run these campaigns, he would, ha have whistleblowers he would find, he would help them out. He had shopping bag stuffers, you know, pamphleteer. He was a kind of a great pamphleteer. And it, this was a kind of an extraordinary house to grow up to, a lucky house, very grateful for all that. It was hilariously funny. And his older sister, Anita Brenner, was really quite a well-known journalist and editor in Mexico, close to Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo in the 1920s, worked at the New York Times in the 30s. Um, her best friend was, in fact, the painter Frida Kahlo. And uh, I'm so interested that, that the Kahlo show has just come to San Francisco. Uh, there are many pictures of Anita in those family scrapbooks of them together. Um, Kala was my, my cousin's godmother. So, unfortunately, my father hated his older sister. So rather than getting to have you know, wonderful times with the Gertrude Stein of Mexico, as many people called her, all I heard was, Anita is a monster. And they didn't speak, they didn't speak. But nevertheless, her, 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 her idea, her, the idea of her, the largeness of her, loomed large in the house. So, you start out, you become a writer for all of these reasons, and you are someone who compulsively takes notes and packages what you see in story form. As you decide you're gonna climb into your own life and your own family story, how did you figure out what was true? Well, that was a tough one. Well, you know, first of all, being a reporter so often is about a f way of finding our own stories and the stories we write about. And w one of the aspects of it that's so interesting for so many of us is if you're an introverted extrovert or a, sh a shy person or rather hidden, asking questions is a great way to hide. Now, if you're writing a memoir, however, it makes you scour because you really care so much about being accurate. And, you know, this was very complicated because, you know, I, I just worried about this for a long time. Who was right? Who was wrong? I, I had my hyper-rational reporter's hat on. Then I began to realize 
it doesn't really matter. You know, part of like the great challenge of writing in a personal way is just saying, well, this is my story, so it's just what's right for me. And that was, that was interesting. But I was very lucky in that we are, the Brenners are a family of letter writers. I, we, we had like these, everyone had a typewriter in the era before there were computers, and we would bang away at typewriters in the middle of the night. Um, as children, as later, my father, my mother, long, long letters. And Anita Brenner turned out to have, be the same kind of obsessive letter writer, pack rat. And all of her papers were in the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas, one of the great archives of the world. So at the point where they were made public, I was able to go on a very traumatic day and see that she had neatly kept hundreds of letters that my father and all of my aunts had wow. written to each other through their childhoods and through their yeah. 20s. And that was powerful. You know, I saw things in patterns that went on 60, 70 years ago that became prophetic, their anger between them that had gone on si 60 years before I was even on the planet that um, actually became stamped on us, you know, became our DNA. Was there anything you saw that helped give you any insight as to why so much of your brother's anger and passion seemed to be channeled into what you regarded as cuckoo politics? Well, that's, again, it's an interesting question. I couldn't, you know, it's, it's hard. What I learned was, I've written biographies, as you know, one about a publishing family, which I drew on letters, the Bingham family of Louisville. And one of the, one of the, things that we do as biographers is we take a letter as a piece of evidence and we say, aha, there's the aha moment. The fact that this person wrote that angry letter to his daughter, in, this, in, in, in the case of the Brenner family, my aunt had a stunning early publication when she was about 23 years old, a book which became really her seminal book, Idols Behind Altars, and my grandfather, working away in, Sa in San Antonio then, and adored this daughter. The book was dedicated to him. She was, had by then gone up to New York and was going to school at Columbia. He wrote her a furious letter saying- He, your grandfather. Yes, right. saying, well, you've broken your promise and you've, you haven't been putting yourself full time in your studies and although, the book was the fir front page of the New York Times book review, and you know it got tremendous attention, made her very, very well known, uh, really a superstar. He said, you have violated our agreement. So he just kind of pulled the carpet on her. And you know, that kind of thing, you know, like you would, f I, you could leap on that and say, well, that says it all, doesn't it? But one of the things that I learned about writing about a family is that there really aren't answers to so many questions and that it's a mistake in a family to think that every question has an answer. You know, were, one of the questions I had going into the book was, do we pass sibling relationships down? You know, was the fact that my father had such a difficult relationship with his older sister, was that the thing that, and I, you know, going into writing this book, I would have said, there it is, the evidence, it's passed down. But the fact is, my brother and I were able to get around this. And he, all the while I was working on this, we were together, and he would say, you have so many damn theories. They're all ridiculous. Just go forward. Live your life. Don't be so obsessed with the past. And he turned out to be a kind of a guru figure for me. I mean, he was absolutely right. Sometimes you don't get to understand everything. What turned, finally? I mean, he's on some level cranky right up until the last day. So what changed for you, and, and would this have ever, ever happened if he hadn't had a life-threatening health crisis? You know, I've been asked that out on the road. Would, would you have been able to repair if the crisis hadn't brought you together? I don't know what the answer to that is, but what changed between us was something so profound and fundamental. And coming over on the plane, I wrote down five points that I thought maybe was what worked for me in transforming, because many people have said to me, 
how do we make it better with a sibling? Mm -hmm. So what changed for us was the first thing that happened is, this is now my new rule one, take action. That I flew out to the orchards. I was, you know, I was, I panicked after 9-11. I would never get this better. What was I going to do? I was, like everyone in New York and America, I was, we were all so traumatized by 9-11. I felt the clock was running out. And I said to my husband, I'm going to go out to the orchards. And now, I'm, this was before you knew that he was sick? No, I knew. Oh, I you knew. didn't know already? I, okay. I knew. I'm going to go out. And he still, you know, although he had this, he was still going full speed. Mm -hmm. And no one would have known he was sick, and he was phobic about that. And he wasn't really sick. He just had what he called his medical condition. And I said, I'm going to go surprise him. So I spent two days. Simply because the world is coming to an end and I you wanted to. Go. Ha I, yeah. I, I felt compelled. It was the moment I knew I had to turn the page. Mm -hmm. And you know, you just know. There's just something that happens to you. You just say, I'm going to turn the page. And I, spent, and I was panicked. I was surprising him because he would have screamed at me, no, I'm too busy, I don't want you here. So I spent a day, I'm embarrassed to say, running all around New York City, trying not to freak out over the sirens, buying flannel shirts, you know, the right kind of orchard clothes, and uh, I was determined, you know, I have to make a good impression. And as I'm leaving, I, I, I thought, oh, this is ridiculous. I wear what I always wear, New York City black. And my husband said to me, you're wearing a black cashmere turtleneck to the orchards? You can't do that. And that's how panicked I was. So on the airplane, I'm looking at every kind of Apple note I can possibly have. I'm trying to learn the Apple business. And I have like files, like a reporter. And I realized I'm treating my brother as if he was a source. And uh, you know, this was so, I just wanted him to like me. I wanted to impress him. I had to do that little sister thing. So the first rule was put yourself into their world. The second thing, that the second part of this was understand how difficult it is and don't wait for a crisis because the fact is if you have this strange relationship with a sibling you're already in kind of a crisis you know you may not recognize it and you may be comfortable and okay with it but it isn't perfect because we all know because we all read the same things that the best predictor of happiness and long-term happiness is to have really good relationships with your family and your friends so the third, the third aspect of this is try to see your sibling as they are, not as you would like them to be. And going to the apple country was huge for me because, again, I'm embarrassed to say, 15 years he had been out there, I had never been once. Mm. You know, I thought this is a lunatic thing my crazy brother is doing with these apples. Well, when I sailed down this beautiful little, this huge area of fruit country, I was just, I mean, imagine after 9-11, apple country at harvest, thousands of acres, glorious blue skies. I just, you know, got tears. It was like America the Beautiful. And, but it was so rural, you know, like, who were these people? You know, it was like such a different world for me. And the first sighting of my brother, because he didn't know I was coming, was at the packing house. And I remember seeing him, millions of apples were coming down the flumes. And my brother was just looking at every single piece of fruit to make sure it would be shipped correctly. And he was so tender. I'd never seen this side of him. I was like seeing him from a long shot. And I thought, oh my God, all he needs is a sweater. He'd look just like Mr. Rogers. Who is this guy? And I began to realize I didn't get it. You know, that I didn't get it. And so that was the beginning. And then I began bombing him with questions about apples and fruit. But there was one moment that really did change things in my perception, which is we were walking one day. I worked the fields with him and the packing house routine in the f 5 a.m. mornings. And we were walking at dawn with the pickers who were all working. 
and my brother was walking ahead of me, and it was so beautiful. I suddenly saw every shade of green of the leaves, and I was able to get my own personality out of the way, and my own ego, and my own need to be seen and validated. And I thought, he's amazing. This brother of mine is amazing. He's built up something astonishing here. You know, it was almost as if he no longer was invisible, invisible to me, or even, you know, just, I could suddenly begin to see him. And then when I watched him walking ahead of me, I realized he has the same gait that I do. You know, he walks, and I thought, well, we're probably so much more alike than we ever allowed ourselves to think. And that was really a kind of beginning moment for me. There's a lot, one of the narratives that runs through this book, particularly as he becomes more sick uh, in, the, in the last part of it, you are the relentless, you're going to be okay, there's going to be hope, if I just do enough journalism and make enough contacts here, I'll fix this. And he is the almost unfailing, despite his occasional request to you really to help, voice of, it's not going to get better, deal with it. Mm -hmm. What did you learn over the course of this thing about that terrible tension between hope and reality acceptance when you're close to someone who has a terminal illness? Oh, well, that's such a, that's such a hard question because the fact is they are so you that you're looking at yourself. Ah. You're so, you know, that it, it's impossible when you're brother, sister, and two and a half years apart to, I, I couldn't give what he was going through a reality. I couldn't put, I couldn't see it for what it was because it was catastrophic. I did, I, now that I had my brother, I was desperate not to lose him. And it You hadn't was, really had him until this happened. I hadn't had him. You know, I, we didn't, we always had that cotton batting between us. We so the thing that was going to take him away. You know, and it was just like, it was impossible to, you, there was no distance because we had a fierce attachment, as it's called, mm -hmm. where when you're that locked together in this, this kind of angry, very strong bond, underneath that is the bond and the real attachment. So detachment and saying this is about him was impossible. Mm. And um, part of that relentless cheerleading going on was just my own failure to be able to say this is real and this is happening. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, we always think we can find a solution to everything, and we can't. Did he teach you that? Yes. You mean the, the, that, we, that we sometimes things we can't understand? If you were go knowing, it's impossible, obviously, but knowing what you know now about how it was all going to play out, would you have done anything differently in the way of ongoing this will be okay, we'll make this okay, we'll try everything, kind of cheerleading? I don't think I, 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 I would have liked to say I would have been a more Buddhist, peaceful, embracing person. It's not my nature. My <laughs> nature is to be that younger sister. Um, I was, yeah, I, I think I was trying to mirror what I perceived he needed, which was, the optimism, you know, I, I, we, we, we just walk around with this idea that optimism always is the way to go, and maybe silence is the way to go. You know, I, I think I would try to be silent more and just let, ask him how mm -hmm. he was feeling. Mm -hmm. This is a really odd question, um, but I thought about it in that very moving line in your book where you said, I finally have a brother and soon I'm going to lose him. Why did you love him? Why do we love our siblings? Hmm. Oh, we love them because we share so much. They're us. No one knows us better. You know, they are, you know, William James often wrote about the core of self and 
that core of self is often hidden from our parents. We hide from our parents, but we don't hide from our siblings. They know us so well. They know every aspect of us. It's why they can drive us crazy, but it's why when, our, when we have a problem, our impulse is to want our brother or sister right there, right next to us. No one could be closer. There's that pull. And uh, that pull is so powerful. I mean, it was a love story, always. Do you think you knew that before you started writing this? I don't know what I knew. I just knew that I had to take action, that I had to be as close to my brother as I could possibly be. And that I'm sure that pull is part of it. You you don't have you you have only the one child or you have a daughter and a and a stepson as well right I have, you have two I kids have, yeah I have I have one I have one daughter and and uh, a stepson that I'm very close to has this changed how you are around them when they're together absolutely in what way absolutely that I try to listen more and I keep you know saying that my my daughter Casey also has a half brother Adam Schwartz that she's very close to. And I just say to all of them, you're a team, you're a team, you know, you have each other through life, you're a team. We do a lot of things together as the two families. We just are very, very close. Well, this seems like a good moment to open it up to any questions that you all may want to ask about the writing process, about siblings, anything else? Yes, a there's a microphone out here. Is there something that you can read to us out of the book that you don't feel we would be able to understand unless it was in your own voice? Thank you. Oh, you want to hear? You want to hear something? Something in her voice. Oh, okay. You have any? You have any ideas? Uh, it's a very. It's an. It's a really interesting structure because it's a real sort of pastiche, right? Um, she's put it together like a quilt. Um, and I would say the scene that you just described where you're arriving and you first see him in the apple orchard. Okay. Do you remember exactly sure. where that is? I'll, I can, I'll, I'll page through and see it. Okay. Um, I might do, what do you think if I do this, just the short, Par this short scene where I describe what he looks like and perfect. we this perfect scene. Perfect. And if you want to revert to your Texas voice. Okay. Marie, <laughs> okay, great. Go okay. for it. Okay, great. Um, well, the last time I saw my brother, um, we had an immense fight. And it was in his house in San Antonio. And I'm describing, the book opens with this fight. So I'm just, this is, this is a sort of a picture of my brother at this exact moment. There are always apples around him, women too, apple pie, Big, chic, antique bowls of wooden apples in all colors, red and gold and striped, apple ceramics, apple pencils, apple photos, produce labels framed on the library wall, Gulf brand Texas vegetables from the Rio Grande Valley, Empire Builder, Wenatchee District Red Seal brand. I'm an American first, then a Texan, he would say, not understanding he sounded like Augie March. The clues are there in the grad school classic, Augie March, I later realize. A man's character is his fate, Saul Bellow wrote, quoting Heraclitus. You always have to show off and tell us what you know, Carl said. I'll be in Washington next week, I say. I have an interview. I have to close a piece. You promised me, he says. You said you would stay away from Washington State. You sat right here and said that you would not go to the Cascades. He yells as loudly as I have ever heard him. Washington, D.C., I shout back. I have the trait as well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as you're thinking about that, I'd like, to t I'd like to ask you to just give us one more. There are two completely surprising and interesting sub-stories that are woven through this narrative of your brother. One, your fabulous aunt character in Mexico, getting Trotsky into Mexico and running around with Frida Kahlo. 
the other, your discovery of the world of apples. Oh, this was astonishing. Um, are we talking about the, the the family, the family apple, the, the family past apples? Both and the way that things come together, yeah. Well, it kind of astonishing. Again, working on, on the idea that everything is passed down in families, or is it, or is it not, or is it coincidence? My father had a very difficult relationship with his father, who was an equal bossy uh, immigrant from the Baltic to Mexico. And, you know, we knew that our family had this chain of nurseries in Texas, but we I never understood because my father would change the subject when his father's name came up, um, how astonishing it was that our grandfather was not just a man who had nurseries, but had wound up having, was an orchardist at the turn of the century. This was all buried history. Which you hadn't even known didn't when you set out to it, do this. Right? Didn't know it, and I didn't know it until I discovered, uh, you know, discovered this at the Harry, at the archive, uh, when I was trying to page through all these things. And then I discovered an obituary that had been written about our grandfather who died when we were much too young to remember him. And it was very, very long in the Texas paper of the time. And it detailed, I mean, this was like the bio, this is like a biographer's study. It detailed, you know, every, all the rare plants, specimen plants, horticultural experiments, everything he had done, introducing them in the state of Texas through the solo serve nurseries. And I was so excited about all of this. And, and, uh, and I, I used to say to my brother, this apple thing, you've gotten it from your grandfather, who he had a reverence for, but he didn't even know. And he would say, that's ridiculous. There's no evidence. But it was so bizarre, Cynthia. I mean, how is it? I mean, you know, first of all, it's such an unusual occupation. When my brother announced that he was going to give up his life as a trial lawyer when he was in his 30s and become an apple orchardist, my father, with his great Texas puckish sense of humor, said, well, Carl, I have one thing to say. What's that, Daddy? Jews don't farm. <laughs> but of course they did. His father clearly did. Well, just to wind up then, what are you working on next? I'm staying, I've become fascinated with the personal. You know, that this is the most excruciatingly difficult book I've ever written. I never thought I could do it. And, and so you're, of course, going to turn around and do it again. Do it again. And so I've been spending a great deal of time, or a month or two a year, and more if I can do it, in India every year. And so my next book is a memoir of going through India and uh, what, this, what this has done to transform my own life. All right. Well, Marie Brenner, thank you very much. Cynthia, thank you. Thank you.